Okay, sorry about that. So back to um, the whole issue of a minimum of 10% free hard disk space on your computer. So again, if you don't see your hard drive partitions, if you don't see uh, but anything, it, a lot of times people are connected to servers and, they're, and it doesn't show, and it's because this check mark right here has been unchecked. Um, so again, to find these things, you go to system, uh, I mean into your finder, finder preferences, this thing opens up. It's the stuff here in the sidebar. This will show you, this is where stuff is actually being shown in the sidebar. Um, you'll also hear in general, these are the things that, where you would actually set it up so that they appear on your desktop. So again, you would check hard drives. You would, I check all of this stuff. I just have it all in there. I want to know what's actually on my computer. It makes it easier to get to it as well. So. With that being said, in the Finder, again, I'm gonna, I've got uh, my uh, Safari showing in the background. I'm going <clears> to <throat> hide that by using Hide Others. In your partition, I need everybody to do this. There are usually, um, in most cases, there's only a single partition. Now, we talked about how to partition hard drives before, right? Did we go through all of that and what they really are? Basically, it's a single hard drive that you separate to appear to be uh, two different hard drives. The truth of the matter is they are still one single hard drive. If the hard drive fails, you would lose both of these partitions. I've got one that's actually named... My screen is so cramped. This is cracking me up. My screen is too cramped to actually show this, but uh, underneath, there's a, I've got a hard drive partition that's called data and another one that's called a boot MPB. Uh, it stands for my boot drive, MacBook Pro. Uh, boot is a phrase that a lot of people use uh, for a drive. It's the startup drive. That's what, so it's, they talk about booting a computer. It's a startup drive. But anyway, in your case, on the, these machines right here, you probably have two, one partition. What's the top partition? What's it called? Boot. It's called what? Boot. Boot, okay. So that's how these are set up. And then there's the safe disk partition. Um, uh, the reason that that exists is that <clears throat> the boot drive itself Every time these machines restart, it goes back to its original state. Um, if you were to save files to that hard drive partition, when these things restart, you would no longer have your files. Um, but that doesn't happen with the safe partition. So at any rate, you need to make sure that you actually do have 10% of free hard disk space. So to figure that out, you would click on the hard drive to make it active. Double clicking on it will only open a window. So it's a single click on there, and then you hit Command I, and it will bring up the info dialog box. If you cannot remember Command I, it's under the file menu. It's the same thing. The file menu, anything that you select. So in our case, we've selected the boot uh, partition. If you come down to the file uh, file menu, down to get info, get info. It's the same thing. You'll see right here, <clears throat> sort of. It's always in the top section part of this. You'll see the capacity of your hard drive and what's available. So in my case, the capacity of my boot drive is almost a terabyte. It's 974 gigabytes, of which 457 of them are available. That's over 50%. Uh, percent. You can also see what's being used. That will give me, that, that's telling me that this hard drive has got basically close to half of its space is available for me to use. If that number is less than 10%, and the easy way to figure 10% is you look at the capacity and you simply um, uh, move your decimal point one place to the left. So 10% of my hard drive that I would need for this would be 97 and a half gigabytes. That's what I would need to safely run either Photoshop or C1 Pro. Does this make sense? Now you've also got to remember that when you're shooting, all of the files that you're shooting when you're actually in a session, you're working in Capture One and you're shooting, you're adding files to that. That space, available space, is dropping down with every single frame that you click on. So it's just something to keep an eye on. You will notice that all throughout Capture One, there's a place that shows you the available space on your hard drive. We'll talk about that when we get there. But at any rate, you would need to do this for both of your drives. You would need to do it for the boot drive because that's where Capture One is running. So on your boot right now, how much space is devoted to the boot? 164 gigabytes. 164 gigabytes, and how much is being used? Or what's available? Uh, first, oh, sorry, that was the capacity is 200 gigabytes available. Okay, so the capacity is 250. What do you need to actually have available? 25. Do you have 25? Yep. So you're good to go there. You need to do the exact same thing on the safe uh, 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 space partition. So I need everybody to click on that once, open it up, and take a look at it, and tell me. Uh, these, all these machines will probably be different because you've got different file sets on there. 
but if you have less than 10%, this is overhead for your computer. If you have less than 10%, what ends up happening is your computer will come to a, it will slow down so much you will think that it's actually frozen. It isn't, but you will certainly feel like it is. If there are things on there, if you have less space than that, you've got to get rid of space. You've got to free something up. Um, if you're working in a studio situation, you do not just indiscriminately start throwing shit away. Um, you would actually have to check with whoever to make sure that um, uh, those files have actually been offloaded onto external hard drives or uploaded to somebody's server or something else. Okay, back to Safari and what it uh, takes to run this guy. Uh, so this 10% free, again, that would be an installation. I mean, 10 gigabytes, you're really looking for 10%. Uh, well, lo and behold, a calibrated color monitor. We've already talked about the importance of this and how uh, major that whole thing is. Um, at the very least, you uh, coming into a situation, you would want to know, even if the color is off or if they say it's been calibrated, have the brightness settings been changed? Has the luminance setting been changed? There's no way that you can know without running calibration on this. Uh, and then the rest of this will give you the minimum of system. Uh, for this, for eight, it's a minimum of Windows 7. Uh, this stand, SP stands for Service Pack 16, blah, 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 blah. This is, you would actually need to know that part. Uh, and then uh, the other sort of weird little things that they're going to say um, have to be installed. Uh, and then a PDF reader if you want to actually read the help files. In the Macintosh world, it's sort of the same processors are required. Again, this is four gigabytes is misleading. That should be eight at a minimum. Uh, again, the same 10%, same monitor. This version of software, either 10, nine or 10. Uh, and then an internal connection. Uh, you're going to need an internet connection if you're going to actually activate Capture One. So, and then <clears throat> there's stuff down here that would be the recommended requirements, and you'll see eight gigabytes of uh, RAM or more, um, all of the above. So, um, yeah, that's the system requirements. So once we get through that, a quick note about Capture One. Um, they have uh, now, like um, uh, Adobe, have moved to a subscription model. They still allow you to buy the full version of the program, but they're on a subscription. But they offer a subscription model as well, so that you can do it by the month. Um, you pay a premium for doing it by the month. You're actually, in my opinion, better off just going ahead and buying the program. There is no student discount on C1 Pro, which I think sucks, but that's that's the case anyway. The thing about it is, is that the program outright is uh, almost $300. I think it's $299. However, it goes on sale fucking all the time. Do not pay full price for this. It's usually when it does go on sale, they cut the price in half. It's just something you need to keep looking for. You just bookmark a link to their website, to their store, and constantly just be looking at it, and you'll see it will go on sale. You can get it for $150. Bucks. Once that happens, um, upgrades are, um, uh, are, major upgrades are $99 every time you do it. Again, if you go to their subscription model, then your upgrades are always free. That part is sort of eliminated. But like I say, there's a premium on doing the subscription part. Yes? I think it's like 13 or $14. I mean, you can find out. We can actually go there really quick. Hit Command L to bring up a new screen in Safari mm -hmm. and put in phase one. And once you get there, go to the store. Is it 15 a month? So, and this is new. So uh, with it being new, here's the store. With the subscription model being new, I don't know how that's going to impact um, what the actual price of it is, uh, and whether they do a sale or not. So here in the buy one, Single uh, uh, license right here is, again, yeah, it's still $300. I don't know if the subscription thing means now that they're never going to run another sale or not. I, don't, I really don't know. I can't help you out on that one. Uh, yes? If you buy it, can you, is it only nine? Like, That's a really interesting question. So this is what happens. <clears throat> you get a license key for it. And so what ends up happening is you'll see, oh, I won't show you that screen. Um, I've been doing this since version three, and, and, and it happens now in all of them. So when you go to activate, 
of your license in the program, you have to be online. It's the only time you have to be online. You do not need to be online to run the program, but you have to be online to activate it. When you activate it, they send you a key, basically a serial number or a license number uh, for it, and you plug that part in. And that will work for whatever version you've got. So let's say um, I'm going to do it for eight so that you can see what would happen when I go to nine. So that key will work for eight and anything earlier. So if I have a version of six, the key that I got for eight will activate version six. Again, I've got to be online to do it, but so that's sort of where that goes. When you upgrade to the next one, when I upgrade to nine, what they would do when I give them my upgrade money is they will give me a brand new key. My old key for eight is made invalid. My new key for nine will work not only for nine, it will also work for eight, seven, six. I don't know if it goes, I don't know if you get back to version five if it'll work for that, but I know it will work for six, seven, and eight. So that's how they manage it. So that when you upgrade, you can't give your old key to somebody else and have it work. The minute you upgrade, your old key is invalid, but your new key will work for any version that it can work for. Make sense? Um, there are two versions of Capture One. There is one called C1 Pro, which is the one that we are looking at right here. There's another one that's actually called DB. The DB one is free. The DB one stands for digital back, but it will only work for like these Mamiya Leafs. It'll only work for phase backs. So if you have a phase one back or you've got a Mamiya, um, a, one of the Leaf or Credo or Aptis backs, those are all owned by phase now. Um, the reason that you get that software free is because you just spent $40,000 on a back and FaZe feels like, well, hey, you know, we're going to gouge you fuckers as much as we can, but maybe we'll give you a small break on the software, right? Thank you so much. So at any rate, um, I just know that that's what happens. So if you're going to run anything else, if you're running any of the 35 millimeter cameras, any of that kind of stuff, the DB version does not support those. Um, it won't do you any good at all. Um, the Pro version... Um, we'll do both. The Pro version will not only do the digital backs, but it'll also do Canons. They've gotten into Sony's now, I'm fairly certain. The one medium format uh, that they do not support is Hasselblad. That's, uh, I think, as much, uh, I think, I don't know this to be true, but I think that is, is, that's more Hasselblad's call than it is FaZe's call, but just so you know. If you are, if you get into a studio situation and you Hopefully you will know this before you get there, that you're working on a Hasselblad system. You call John. Are you, cause you got a, you've got a Hasselblad back, right? Yeah, and I have lots of experience troubleshooting all the shittiness of Focus. Yeah, so Hasselblad's, Hasselblad's C1 Pro is a program called Focus, um, with a PH, Focus. Um, and uh, it, it, it is not, uh, I mean, John, you've had enough experience with both programs. They're not radically dissimilar. I mean, they kind of function the same way. Stuff is in sort of different places. The structure of, of catalogs and sessions is different. But basically, once you get rolling, the whole sort of idea of shooting tethered preview, all that kind of stuff is pretty much the same, right? Yeah. And it should also be said that if you want to experience focus or learn how to use that software, you don't need a hospital. Like Capture One, it'll work with Canons and Sony's, I'm pretty sure. And it's free, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, Focus, thing, yeah. Focus, Focus is, is free software. So if you know that that's going to actually happen, if you know you're going to go into a studio and that's actually going to happen to you, um, you should download the software and you should hook up your camera and you should be doing this a week before you go to that studio and you should just spend time with it. Um, but I would argue the same thing holds true. If you know you're going into a studio that's not using Speedatron, let's say they're using uh, Profoto, um, uh, they're, whatever gear they're using, they're using Bron Color or Ellen Chrome or Pro, um, um, uh, Profoto, whatever they're using, whatever. Um, you should at the very least download the manual and work your way through that. If you can get your hands on a pack, all that much the better so that you, when you go into that, you're not trying to guess about how to work it. Again, power packs by and large function somewhat the same way. They're all pumping watt seconds out through a, a head. Um, but the dials, bells, and whistles on the top um, will be different for every uh, brand. So that's the good thing. You'll still know, twelve. You know that 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 twelve hundred watt seconds on a on a Ellen Chrome power pack is one stop less than twenty four on that very same power pack. Okay. Um, 
You can now activate this on up to three machines. <clears throat> it actually is interesting, though, the way this works. If you go back into Capture One, you can actually, you should have it started up by now. Uh, I'm going to hit, if you got this screen asking if it wants to open recents or actually do something new, you can pretty much just hit cancel there. Come up to Capture One down to Preferences, and we'll take a look right here. And Preferences under, I don't know where this guy actually is. I'm going to say possibly in updates. I'll look for it again. It may actually be under the help menu, so let me check that right there. Yeah, I'll find it for you guys later. The thing is, is you can actually deactivate it. Here it is. Under Capture One, under License, when this thing opens up, you can actually deactivate a computer. Now, what Phase One's really doing in this is it's not looking at your version of the software. It actually looks at the machine that you've got um, this activated on. So, for instance, when I activate it on my computer, there's a thing on this computer called a MAC address or a MAC ID, and it's not the same as Macintosh, that MAC. It's every single... A uh, piece of hardware that exists in computer land that is capable of being uh, internet aware has what they call it's a it's a it's called a MAC address. It's a unique address. Um, if you wanted to actually find the MAC address of this computer, you would go right back up to the Apple menu to about this MAC. When this guy opens up, you actually would click on System Report, and somewhere in here would be the MAC address for this guy but it's not there. At any rate, without getting into all of that, um, what happens in the phase activation right here is that it knows what computer, what, what your, activate, what your uh, computer ID is. If you run out, let's say you've got two laptops and two desktops and you can't run this software on all four at the same time, um, you can deactivate one and switch it to the other. The minute you deactivate uh, one of your sites, another one will actually open up and you can activate it on that. Does that sort of make sense? So it used to be when I would travel back and forth from New York, we would deactivate. It used to be you only could have this on two machines, not on three. So I had a laptop that I took back and forth between uh, Chicago and New York, and then I had a desktop in New York, a desktop in Chicago. I would, right before I would leave, I would deactivate the desktop in Chicago, and when I'd land in New York, I would activate that one, and then do the same thing on the, on the road back in reverse. So just so that you know that that's what's going on. The reason they added the third license to that was for everybody was doing exactly what I was doing. Um, there is an issue now with connectivity. In newer uh, backs and newer phase backs, um, and this was never ever a problem for um, uh, um, uh, uh, Canons or Nikons, but in the older versions of um, uh, 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 phase one digital backs, um, John, I don't know, is your Hasselblad back, does it connect with USB or is it FireWire? It's uh, FireWire. Yeah, okay, so John's gonna have the exact same problem with his Hasselblads that anybody who has legacy um, uh, uh, phase backs have. I've got a P-series phase back, I've got a P30 plus, it only takes FireWire, it does take FireWire 800. It's exactly the same cord that I just used. Oh, by the way, did everybody get those files copied? Anyway, before I hand this to this is a FireWire connection right here. You cannot plug this into any of these computers. These do not have FireWire ports anymore. So you use this thing instead. This is a Thunderbolt 2 FireWire connection. However, there's a problem with this. FireWire was always designed to do two things. It was designed to supply power, I mean to do data, so it transfers data. But this thing was also used to supply power. When you plug this thing in, Thunderbolt was never designed to supply power. So when you plug this in, you lose the power connection to those backs. So those backs, the data can transfer, but you can't run the back. The back needs power to actually run. So, there you go. so there's a workaround. There's two workarounds to get around this. Um, the first workaround is you saw that little dongle that I actually had, that little white thing. You need to get one of those, which will actually do the data transfer for you. So you can go from your digital back. You can actually um, uh, use uh, um, that. You would connect it again. That would be your firewire connection. However, you have to supply power to the back, independent of that, because that doesn't do it anymore. 
In the P-series older backs, that means you have to load the battery into the back. In most studio situations, if you're shooting with a P-series camera, if you're using FireWire, they don't put the back, they don't put the batteries in the back. So you guys have seen this on these cameras. This is what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the battery that actually runs the camera. I'm talking about the battery that goes into the back. It's this guy right here. These little guys right here. In a P-series, <clears throat> in an IQ series, which is another face back, you don't have to have this if you've got FireWire, which is a really nice thing because this thing weighs. So you eliminate this weight. You simply plug the FireWire cable in, and if you've got a FireWire cable on your computer, it will supply the uh, power that this back needs, and it will drive the back. So if you don't have it, you've got to supply power to this, and this is the guy that you do it with, right? If you don't have that, so that's one solution. There is another solution. I need everybody to <clears throat> open up a new window in, um, uh, um, in a Safari. Again, these are the things that you need to know because these are the mm -hmm. things that you're going to be expected to fix when all of a sudden somebody goes, hey, I used my uh, you know, FireWire to Thunderbolt converter. Why isn't this working? And you're the person to say, you need power. You've got to supply power to the back. So again, the battery option is one. In addition to doing the FireWire to Thunderbolt, that's one way to get around it. The other way to get around it is this. If you go to uh, put up a new window, uh, I'm just going to type in Max Sales. These people make the uh, what I think is arguably the best hub. Once you get there, search the site, type in uh, FireWire Hub. It will take you to this thing. You will see that there's a couple of them in here. <clears throat> there's an uh, uh, IO Gear one that they actually sell. That's not the one that you're looking for. You're looking, oh, right here. This is the, uh, Apple is the only people that actually make this thing. Uh, this is an Apple Genuine Thunderbolt to FireWire 800 adapter. Do not buy third party ones of these. They don't work. You just lose your money. Um, these things, even though Apple does make these, um, people go through these things. I, I know people who go through these one a day. Um, so that's how sort of fragile they are. What can I tell you? Uh, again, I would never go into a shooting situation with only one of those and be counting on it. But again, as you continue to scroll down, I can't believe they don't have this. Yep, right down there. Uh, as you continue to scroll down, this is the thing that you're looking for right here. You're looking for this OWC, which is stands for Other World Computing, 12-port uh, Thunderbolt Dock 2. And if you look at the back of this dock, what you'll actually see, let me see if I can get this thing to actually get up a little bit bigger. What you'll see is that it's got three USB 3 ports on one side. It's got um, uh, headphones and um, uh, a microphone. But right here, this is the one that you care about. This is actually a FireWire 800 port. This is Ethernet. These are two Thunderbolt ports. And this is HDMI. Um, you've also got on the side of this thing, these are two high-powered USB 3 ports. So the thing that makes this different is that if you use this setup, <clears throat> you would plug your back into a FireWire cable, the FireWire cable into this port. This is a powered port. This will supply all the power that your FireWire connection needs. So in this case, you would not have to use the battery in the digital back, and you can connect your Thunderbolt here. Now, that means that you've got this box that sits in between, but this is the most efficient way of dealing with computers that no longer have a FireWire connection if you're using a digital back that requires one. Make sense? Okay. Is it really worth it that much just not using the battery in the back? I understand it's weight, but then again, like, this is a really expensive option compared to just having a... Oh, I would agree with that altogether. But, you know, when you say it's not really the weight, um, I actually broke my hand once, and I went to, and I got it set. I fell off a, a, a roof. Yeah. It wasn't that high. It was about as high as this. But anyway, I fell off, jammed my hand, broke my wrist. Um, and so they put it in a cast, and, you know, a month and a half goes by, and they take the cast off. And they go in and they say, so, I was in, you know, uh, physical therapy, and they said, we want to taste your, test your grip strength. And I was like, okay. 
So they hand you this thing, this machine, and it, it's, it's just got this handle that you squeeze and there's a little dial on the top of it. And depending on how hard you squeeze, the little dial goes up and it just stays there and they read the number. So I go in and they put it in my right hand and I squeeze it, whatever, and they look at it and they say, no, that can't be true, do it again. So I do it again and they said, oh my God. And I was like, what? And they're like, the place that I was at, the surgeon that I was at was the surgeon for the Chicago Bears. I have greater grip strength than any single one of the Chicago Bears has. <laughs> <laughs> and you want to know why I have that grip strength? Because I spend my life <clears throat> doing this, holding this five-pound fucker <laughs> and doing all of this, but it's constantly in my hand doing this is why I've got more grip strength than, well, I won't even get into bears, but anyway. <laughs> uh, so just pointing that part out, just so you, that you know. Um, so anything that makes it lighter is something that I would appreciate. Um, anyway, okay. There are other solutions to this. If you are actually working on in a desktop environment, now this holds true again for anybody who's working in a PC world or anybody who's working in a Mac world that is not these kind of machines, that's not something like a iMac or one of these guys. If you're working in a tower environment or a desktop environment, and this holds true for the trash can version of uh, Apple's, um, um, you know, the, high, the highest end of the Apple uh, computer lines right now, they all take um, what they call PCI cards. And they're cards that you can actually, there's, if you open up the computers, you'll see there's a series of empty slots in there. And those slots are designed to add third-party everything. So for instance, if you've got a tower that doesn't have FireWire, you can actually buy a FireWire card. And you can put the card into your tower and then you can connect directly to that. There's a catch to that though. You need to go, if you're gonna do this, you need to go to phase one site. There's a list of FireWire cards that are supported. They're not all the same. So you can't just go out and buy any FireWire card. You have to check the compatibility of phases site. Again, something else you should be writing down because if this comes up and all of a sudden you buy, oh, oh, I'll take care of your problem. You just need a card and you buy the wrong card and it doesn't work or you think it should work and you don't understand why it's not working and so you suspect that it's something else and indeed it might just be the compatibility of the card. Uh, but speaking of those cards, it's another way that you can actually add. There are other things that you can add. You can add, for instance, if you've got a tower that does not have USB 3, you can go out and buy a USB 3 PCI card, stick it in your machine, and you will have USB 3 ports. Um, it's an amazing thing. It's unfortunate that they don't have a system that's similar to that for laptops, but they really don't. Okay. And, and I'm not sure that this is uh, possible on your all's computer, mm -hmm. but this is uh, because I think these things are too locked down. But I'm going to show you the way that I would approach to create a trouble-free environment. Now, again, this is going to be something that applies to your own home machine. Um, I don't know that a studio would allow you to do this, but if they would, this could be a possibility. Now, it might not be something that you would do right away, but this would be something to consider if you get into trouble. This goes under troubleshooting, okay? But it's this. I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna log out of my computer. Uh, I'm, I take it back, I'm not gonna log out yet. I'm gonna go into my system preferences. You can go here with me, actually, uh, Go ahead and do this. It, I don't think it's going to let you do this, but go ahead and do this. If you'll bring up your system preferences to get there, go to the Apple menu down to system preference. Um, this screen will open up. If you only see one thing that's in here, like I just picked it for the mouse. Uh, if you look at the top of this window, the thing that looks like it's got all these dots on it, this is just to show you that, that you get, this is the way to get to the window that will show you all of the system preferences. This is what I'm actually looking for right here. Down here in users and groups, if you click on that, it will open up a window. By default, this thing is locked. If you click on this, and this is where I think you guys are gonna run into problems, you've got to uh, then enter an administrator password. In my case, I'm gonna put mine in. I don't think you guys can get any further than this, right? Okay, so then just watch my screen or watch this thing up here to see how the rest of it goes. Once you get into this, you can actually create a brand new user. If you click on this, you can actually put in a user uh, name right here. You can build a new user and again, the type of account that you would actually have. Standard will actually let you uh, run the computer but not administrate it. 
uh, administrator gives you access to work everything on the computer. Uh, again, you guys can't get in to even build this thing. But in my case, what I would do, again, in this troubleshooting environment would be, you can leave it on standard, that part doesn't really matter, but I would create a new user and I would actually call this new user capture one. And then go ahead and put in a password. I would use a separate password. I would not use the cloud for this. I would put this in, type in uh, the word here, blah, 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 and you'll see. It's saying to me that I can't, that this is already being used by another person. But anyway, you would go through and you would create that person. Now you'll see in my case, I've got one that's created right here, right? I'm gonna show you my desktop really quick. I just want you to see what's going on here. And you'll see there's shit all over my desktop. There's all sorts of things going on here. There's other things that have also happened here. If you look at, li at my library, for instance, you will see under application support, there's all sorts of programs in here. My Quicken is in here. I've got stuff from all sorts, anything that I've, a program that I've ever put in here, all of the support files, all of that kind of shit is loaded into my library. Well, if one of those files happens to be in conflict with Capture One, Capture One does not work, or it works poorly, or it works slowly, or you run into a problem. Does that make sense? So to avoid that, what I do is I've built this separate user, and again, if you, uh, I don't wanna change out my user right now because it'll kill this recording, and I don't wanna do that, but you'll see right here, it's this Capture One warning. When I log in to Capture One, the only, into that user, the only thing I've ever done in that program, ever, is run Capture One. I've never gone online in that. I've never opened up Photoshop in that. I've never done anything in that. It is a virgin setting. I've never installed any extra software. The only thing I've ever done in that environment was either install Capture One or upgrade Capture One. That gives me as clean a system as I can possibly have to run Capture One in. Make sense? It can alleviate a whole lot of problems. So it's just something to keep in mind, yes. Again, it's only looking at the machine. It's not looking at the user. So it knows once you get it licensed in one user, it's licensed for all the users that would be using this machine. All right. Shoot. So would it make sense to have, so whatever personal administrator that we have, then one with just C1 Pro, and then another one with C1 Pro and a Creative Suite? Just because I go, at least even when I'm tethering, I go back and forth. If, if you, in, in that case, I would not hesitate to run, to, uh, to run those two together, to run Photoshop and C1 Pro together, but nothing else, okay. right? So don't be checking your email and don't be using your calendar in there and don't be doing, you know, don't just, if you need to use it, you need to use it. That makes total sense. Most people don't even, ever even go anywhere near this step. But I'm just trying to tell you guys, if all of a sudden you're in trouble and you cannot figure out, there's nothing else that seems to be working, um, then get to a virgin state and run it from there. You always shoot in that brand. I always shoot in that. I always, whenever I've got a day of shooting, whatever, I always log in under Capture One. Uh, and I'm not doing it now because, again, I don't run. I don't, right now, I'm recording this uh, using Safari and I don't want to run Safari in my Capture One space. You'll notice another thing though that happens when you do this and you'll see when we get to our working files. Until you, if you only have a single user <clears throat> in your space that you can log into, you do not have this folder here called shared. Now if you open up your screen uh, and you look on the side over here, do you guys have a shared partition? Is there one or no? There isn't one? Okay, so what that means is that there's only a single user has ever been set up for these machines. Then that's what you're being logged in as. If the second that you get a second user, you this folder, this uh, partition, <coughs> it's not, it's, it's, this folder is actually created for you. This folder is common for all of the users. It shows up for everybody and this folder has no permission issue on it. So how many people in this room have ever tried to copy a file or open a file or something has happened and it comes up and it says, you can't do that. You do not have permission to do that. Does that happen to all of you guys? Does that not happen to anybody? Well, 
the system software that runs all of Apple's, it's actually based on really um, on a, I would call it really old, but it's actually not, um, it's just a very mature um, software code called Unix. Um, and at the underlying part of all Unix is permissions. And the, the problem that you can run into is permissions can get corrupted. And what can happen is you can actually be shoot al shooting along and everything's working fine, and all of a sudden a client says, Give me, could you put those files on a hard drive for me and let me take them home so that I can I'll look at them tonight or edit them tonight? And you do that, you copy them, you give them to the client, they go home, whatever, and they end up hitting a permission issue and they can't open the files. They can't see the files. And this can happen for absolutely no reason. You don't know that it's happened, blah, 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 blah. If you can constantly shoot to this shared partition, this shared folder right here, this shared folder by definition removes permission issues. Anything that gets put on this folder has got open permissions for everybody. So you eliminate the possibility of this permission issue becoming uh, something. Does that make sense, what we're talking about here? So again, another reason to create a separate user that would be just to capture one user is it gives you this shared folder and that and if you now shoot to that shared folder, anybody else, anybody, if somebody else comes along and logs into this machine, under their name, not under my name or not under the Capture One name, they can access this folder. Make sense? So for instance, you'll see right now, I am logged in here. I'm logged in as Versor Engelhardt. I'm gonna actually go to my user's disk, I mean my user folder. So I'm opening this up, I'm gonna look at users, I'm gonna look under, well, we'll look at the Capture One guys. And you'll see, if you can see all of these folders right here, they've all got this little minus check mark down in the bottom. You'll see if I double click on this guy, I can't open this thing up. It says, I don't have the permission to open this thing up. So again, in shared, you don't have that on any of these guys. No matter who you log in under, these things will be available to everybody. So, but this folder will not exist unless you have got more than one user. Are there questions about this? Okay. All right, so let's jump into Capture One. So if everybody can, uh, open, make sure that they've got it. Um, you'll continue to get these things that are asking you if you want to actually do this. In my case, I'm going to hit cancel out of this. However, I am going to come up. So do you guys all have a blank screen or have you got a session opened or a new session open? Okay, I'm going to show you a number of ways of actually building sessions and how we should talk about this. Um, so instead of being in Capture One right now, do me a favor, jump back into the Finder really quick. I want you to click on your user, and what I don't know what the user of these is called now. What is the username on this? It is called Studio. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, uh, and what you're really looking for is just your pictures folder. So, come down to. This is so bizarre. Scroll down. Scroll up. They don't have this in here right now. So do a search for. If you just click in your search box for pictures. Oh. So it's got to be this man. Oh, so anyway, so yeah, do a search. Can you all find the pictures folder? When you do find the pictures folder, if you simply drag the folder over to here under favorites, you'll have it. So you'll see, in my case, it's not here right now. So I'm simply going to grab the picture folder and drag it over here and wherever you put it. So I'm going to drop it right in there. Then you can find the pictures folder. Has everybody found their picture folder? Okay, we are gonna put a blank folder inside a picture folder. So to get a blank folder, you either come up to the file menu down to new folder, or the shortcut for it is command shift N. And it'll put a folder inside there that'll actually give you, it's called untitled, and we're gonna name the folder. So this is how I would set up to do a shooting today for this class, all right? So that's what we're gonna set it up. So again, the naming convention that I use for my folders is identical to the naming convention that I'm gonna use for my session. So 
in my session here, I'm gonna for my folder, I'm gonna do two zero one six the year, one zero the month, and then one five the day underscore verser because that's well, who are we gonna shoot for today? Let's pick an artificial client. Let's do it for Neiman Marcus. So put in NIE uh, underscore fashion. That's just to keep it separate from the um, 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 uh, if I was shooting beauty for them or not. So before you hit enter on this or actually do this, drag across this name and copy it. So I just drag across it. Command C will copy that. If you can't remember it, it's up to the edit menu down to copy. And all we've done is put this name on, uh, on our clipboard. And then go ahead and just hit the enter key. And you will notice that it files it up here. You will also notice that I've got other files that I've actually done in here. One of the beautiful things about uh, doing your naming convention like this is that <clears throat> if you have your images sorted, by, if you have your windows sorted by name, um, it'll always be the bottom one because, again, the one for today will be one day later than the one that I built yesterday. The one that I built yesterday would be just before this. To change the order of how your windows are sorted, it's this drop-down menu right here, and you can see in this case that it's set to none. If you click on name, these things will be actually sorted by name, but you can click on other things like uh, the date added. And if you do that, you'll see at the very top, just because we just rebuilt this guy, it's sitting right up here at the top. So sometimes if you're looking for something in one of these uh, Apple windows and you can't find it, uh, doing the date added one is a great one because it'll actually, oh, that's why it's up here at the very top. There's also a cheat that happens. This works in Windows as well as Macintosh World. There's a series of illegal characters that they will not let you, that they don't like for you to put in. So for instance, if you click at the beginning of this name to put in another character and you type in a question mark, It'd be interesting to see. It does let us put that in, but that would be considered an illegal character. That question mark will keep this from being uploadable to virtually any server that there is in the world. You won't be able to use this. That is an illegal character. However, what's not an illegal character is an underscore. If you put in an underscore, then what happens when you do a sort by name, this will be at the very top. That underscore comes before any letters and before any numbers. Letters come before numbers do, so you'll see anything in here that's actually got numbers in it comes before anything that begins with A. But in my case, I don't need to keep that underscore in there. I don't need to send it to the top. I'm just showing you how some people uh, actually would set this up to have this work. So now I'm gonna go into Capture One. And I, because I keep getting this window, I'm going to still cancel out of this. You could say new session right here or new catalog, um, or you can actually browse for something that you've already shot. This uh, menu remembers recent shootings that you've actually uh, done that will allow you simply to open that. But in our case, I'm going to cancel out of this to show you <clears throat> that instead you can come up to the file menu and you can come down and you can do new catalog or new session. So we need to talk about the differences in catalogs and sessions. How many people in this room have never used Lightroom? Okay, so for the rest of you, Lightroom is a catalog program. What it's designed to do is every file that you shoot gets brought into your Lightroom catalog, and it ends up being just one giant file. So all of your images are in there, all of your shootings are in there, everything that you've ever done is in this one file. And when you double click on that file, you go into Lightroom. Lightroom is a database catalog, and it basically lets you search for images. It's really good at doing stuff like that. Also, any of the work that you do, any of the developing work that you do in Lightroom, it's remembered in a database. So you have a, a history that is also permanent. That history stays, as long as you don't corrupt that file or as long as you don't throw your Lightroom catalog file away, it will remember everything that you've ever done to an image, no matter how long it goes back. It, it remembers everything. So for some people, that's a really great way to work. Um, for other people, specifically the work that we do, it is not necessarily a good way to work. It's not impossible, but it's not good. And the problem that we run into is this. <clears throat> Imagine when um, I shoot a day at shop for Jockey they have usually three or four teams that are working full time and a typical day for us is probably somewhere 100 to 200 gigabytes per set. 
That's almost a terabyte of information every day they shoot, and they shoot every day. And that's just the fashion on figure people. That's not the other people. Imagine how much, how many files that is and how big that gets, right? A terabyte a day. Can you imagine putting all of that into one file? At the end of the year, you've got a 365 terabyte file that you've got to load onto something. Nightmare. Won't happen, can't happen, blah, 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 blah. So instead, what they do and what most studios, again, I've never been in a studio situation when anybody actually shot to a catalog, anybody developed a catalog. But just so that you guys know, we'll look at catalogs at the very end of our discussion, not today, in weeks from now. We will actually look at it so that you're at least familiar with the, that whole concept. But does that sort of make sense, what's going on with the catalog? What happens with sessions is they are completely separate and they are unique to themselves. And the advantage of that for you guys as a digital tech is that you build a session for a particular day, a particular client, a particular shooting. They get that session, and then you go on to the next, and you do a different one for another client on another day for a different job. Um, some people uh, will actually build new sessions every single day. Some people will do it just for the week. It all depends on how you want to structure your shooting. But the advantage of that is that all of your files are right there. All of your raw files are accessible right there. If you had done the catalog thing, in order to get to one of your raw files, you've actually got to export that raw file. Again, it's, 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 it's a great thing, I think, for people who do catalog stuff. Imagine you're a fine artist. You only shoot pictures for yourself. Then that becomes a viable um, a solution for you is to do a Lightroom catalog or to do a catalog here in C1 Pro. Um, all of your images together, you're just searching for your tree pictures or you're just searching for your whatever. And it's nice to have it all in one place. For people who do stock photography, it's a great thing to have it all in one place so that you can do a search for trees and it will show you, if, you, if you're good about doing your keywording, it will show you every single tree picture that you've done your entire career as long as, that's, as long as you brought it into that same catalog. That's a great thing to have. If you've got sessions like we're going to build right now, it becomes extremely difficult to do that same type of search because you're having to search across a whole series of sessions. They're not all in one place. So you'd have to open every single session individually, do a search for it, blah, blah. It just gets to be harder to do. Make sense? So we are going to do sessions instead. So to do that, you actually come to the file menu and you come down to new session. You see you can do either one right here, but we are going to do a new session. And this thing opens up a dialog box. And I'm simply going to hit command V or up to the edit menu down to paste. And it will actually put the shooting, the session that I'm going to do now is going to, it's going to actually be named like this. However, I'm going to show you two different ways to actually set up and use sessions. Um, I'm going to show you, the way I'm going to show you right now is more old school, then I'm going to show you the modern version of how people do this to this now, to this day. Okay, so in doing all of that, again, we're now at this stage of the game, I need to think about how my day is going to go down. And it's basically shot count. I'm a fashion shooter. I need structure to what I'm actually shooting. And that structure means that I need to separate one outfit from the next. So in a lot of clients, what they would ask you to do is actually put in an identifying number for the garment that you're actually shooting. That's usually called an SKU. It's SKU just stands for, the, it's the tag number that will actually happen. When you guys go to um, uh, any, store that you go to when you're buying clothes, whatever, uh, on the tag that gets the price on it as well, there'll be a number on there that identifies what that garment actually is. That is an SKU number. It's an identifier number. Most clients who shoot fashion use SKU numbers. Uh, if not, there are a lot of other clients who shoot other stuff. They will use an identifier number for that. In my case, when I shoot for myself, when I'm doing fashion, uh, shooting editorial pictures, that kind of stuff, I don't put an SKU number in there. I actually just identify it by shot, by shot count. So on a typical day, a uh, typical editorial day, I'll do nine shots. So it'll be shot one, shot two, shot three, shot four, shot five. Does that sort of make sense? But I want to keep those separate from one another because I don't want to mix them all together. I, I, it's it, to my advantage to, have, <clears throat> to be able to look only at shot one, only at shot two, only at shot three. I don't want to lump all this together. So in order to do that, I'm actually now going to add an underscore. I need you guys to do this exact same thing with me. And I'm going to put in an 01. <clears throat> now, once you put in that 01, what's going to end up happening now 
I will need you to copy this. Again, copy the entire thing now. So drag across it. Command C will copy that or up to the edit menu down to copy. Now you get to actually put this session. This is going to be the very, this is going to be a completely separate session that we're building for my shot number one. So you need to say where you want to put this now. And the next thing under for location, if you click on this, this window will open up. You need to navigate to your pictures folder, which is why I told you to put it over here in your favorites. And then you actually need to go down and find the folder that we actually created for today. And it's this one right here, this 20161015 underscore NEI underscore fashion. If you click on that and say choose, you will see now that you are putting this one that's got the exact same name with this addition of 01 into that parent folder. Now, in most cases, this is where people would simply hit OK. There are other clients that will actually ask you to add that same name to the capture folder, possibly to the output folders. So they'll ask you. And if, you, if they ask you to do that, you would simply come into capture. You would either do a dash or an underscore. Most people do dashes. And then again, Command V will paste that in. And they will name capture folders this way. The advantage of doing that is that if somehow the capture folder gets separated from everybody else, at least you know what the heck this is. In our case, we don't need this, so I'm going to erase it. I just want you to know that there's some people that will ask you to add the uh, capture naming to these uh, uh, subfolders as well. In our case, we're not going to do that. I'm simply going to erase that, and then I'm going to hit OK. And then if you navigate, it will actually open up a window for you. If you go back into the Finder and let's go and find that folder that we just created, you will see in the parent folder for today that you have created this folder inside of it that is actually named exactly the same as the parent, except it's got the extension of 01 on it. If you then click on this folder and look inside, what you will see is incredibly important. This is the structure that Capture One expects for a session. There's a number of things in here that are important, so we need to look at these and talk about these. The first thing is <clears throat> you've got a Capture folder in here, an Output folder, a Selects folder, and a Trash folder. We will talk about all of those in a second. And then you've got this guy up here. And this guy up here <clears throat> is actually the preference file for the session. If you lose this preference file for the session or you somehow corrupt this thing, you're going to have to rebuild the session. We will look at how to do that a little bit later on. But what this thing controls is everything about your session. It controls how Capture One looks when you open this thing up. It controls all of your structure for favorites, which we'll get into later. It's got all of this information is all contained within this session preference right here. So it is a good thing not to lose this this guy. We're going to go back into Capture One again, and we're going to create the rest of my day. So to create the rest of my day, you will see now that this window has actually opened up. Um, I'm going to make sure that my screen looks like yours first really quick, so hang on. So is this how your old screen roughly looks? You've got a viewer right here, you've got thumbnails down here on the bottom, and you're looking at your library. Is that how yours looks? No? I don't know. There's no... Th okay, well then let's actually get this to the default. If you come up to your window menu and you come down to workspace, you can come down and click on default. And this will give you what Capture One looks like when it's loaded fresh with nobody has actually screwed around with this thing. And by definition, you should have library that sits right up here. Has everybody got that part? You will also notice that the session that we just created is sitting right here in this menu. If I click on my drop down menu, you will see this is actually this, this menu actually remembers the 10 most recent, I think it's the 10 most recent um, sessions that I've actually uh, worked in not made, but actually worked in, so that I can actually go back in time. Um, I can also clear this menu if I want to, but I don't want, we don't need to do that part right now. Instead, what I want to do is build the rest of my sessions for the day. So, to build the rest of my sessions for the day, <clears throat> I'm going to simply click on this plus right here. When you click on that plus, you get a drop-down menu, and again, you can either do new session or new catalog. 
It's the same as going up to the file menu and coming down to new catalog or new session. Now, this is something that drives me absolutely nuts. Look at the order that you've got up here in the file menu. Catalog is at the top, session is next. If you click on the plus, session is on the top and catalog is next. Now, it doesn't really matter, but I'm just that kind of person that that is just, if I saw that and I was the head of engineering at phase one, I would be screaming at the top of my lungs. Why is this not consistent? Clearly you don't care about alphabetizing it. At any rate, the reason I bring that up is that don't assume that you simply go and pick the first of the new because if you create a new catalog, it is a completely different issue. So anyway, we are going to do another new session. So simply click on new session. A dialog box comes up and you hit command V. You simply paste in the number that you did before. Hit the delete key once and put in a two. This is now going to be for our session number two. You will see that the location is going to be the exact same folder and I'm gonna go ahead and say okay. It'll create the new session, and you will also notice that it's now been named O2 right here, which is great. You'll also see in your drop-down menu, you can go back to shot one. I'm on O2 shot right now. We're gonna do this one last time. So again, click on this new session. There's something that again, I think is on by default. When you said that you wanted, oh, let's go ahead and do the last one. So again, paste to get uh, uh, this to go back in. Hit the delete key once and come into O3. Do you have open new window checked by default on your machines? Okay, well, if you do, that is a very dangerous thing to actually have checked, and this is why. Capture One <clears throat> is capable of having multiple windows open of multiple sessions. The problem that you run into doing that, though, is that your camera can only connect to one session. It cannot connect to multiple sessions. So, for instance, if you had session one and two both open, and your camera was connected to session one and you are looking at session two and you're trying to shoot into session two and you're saying to the photographer, you can't shoot, I'm not connected, I'm not connected, I'm not connected, I can't figure it out. And all of a sudden you start troubleshooting the cables and you're trying to unplug shit and plug stuff in and is it the camera back, is it the cable is bad, whatever. It's because you've got a second window is open. You don't know it's open because it's sitting behind your first window. Um, so again, I never, ever, ever would have multiple windows open here. I think that that's absolutely just an invitation uh, for trouble. So I would uncheck that at all costs, leave that part off. So anyway, we're gonna go ahead and build the third session right now and we're gonna say okay. And you again will see that this is now going to change to an 03. If we go back out to the finder one more time, you will actually see that you've got all three of these shots are sitting here right now and you will see each one of them has its own unique set of subfolders. Each one of these has a capture folder, output, selects, and trash. Each one has its own unique um, uh, preference file. Um, and we can go right on down the line. So we've got these three guys going. And that's how a lot of people will actually end up doing their shooting. Now, or, or they're setting their stuff up. Now, this becomes a really good way of doing it if, for instance, you had, let's say you were shooting for multiple destinations in a day, or maybe you're actually shooting for multiple clients in a day. So let's say for instance, you are working at a freelance studio and they've got a Nike job in the morning and they've got a McDonald's job in the afternoon. You would not want to be putting those two shootings together. You would do separate sessions for each one of those shootings. You could conceivably still have it in a parent folder that was maybe for the day, something like that. But nonetheless, you would want separate ones because you would want to be able to send the McDonald's shooting to the McDonald's people and the Nike shooting to the Nike people. You would want to have those things totally separate. So this sort of structure to do that is really a good thing as far as that whole part goes. Yes. So when you're actually handing these files off to the yes. client, yes. are you just straight up giving them yes. this file? You're not doing anything else with it? So it all depends on the client. In the case of Nike, what they do <clears throat> is they archive all the raw files. But for what we do, we develop stuff right out then and there. During the shooting, I actually edit my first picks. Then the digital tech will process those first picks. He will give them a full res TIFF file and he also gives them a low res JPEG file that's called an FPO. FPO stands for for position only. You guys should write that down because you're going to hear this the rest of your lives. 
FPO is for position only. It's a very small file that they use to um, do layout work with. If you're familiar with InDesign at all, <clears throat> it would be the same sort of thing. They would actually, InDesign does it by itself, but basically when you place a photograph in an InDesign document, it makes a very small copy of that uh, it's a very low res version of that file that you can then move around. That's why they call it four position only. It's not big enough to print, but it is big enough that you can actually do layout work with it. Um, so those are the two files that they get. So one, the, all the raw files get shoved off onto an archive server that is automatically backed up to another archive server. Um, and then the um, process TIFF file and the four position only JPEG file get sent to a completely different server and that's what they work with. So that would be the file that then is sent to India to be retouched. Um, it's all marked up and blah, 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 blah. That's how they do it. Other clients, uh, Bonton that I shoot for whatever, they take the entire shooting, every single raw file they take. So in a situation where you Mm -hmm. Is there a way to tell the actual one to automatically generate those as you're shooting in a, another file, or that has to be done after? You wouldn't do it. Do you guys understand the question? What John's asking is that, can I, have, uh, can I have Capture One doing two things at once? Can I basically have it processing files for me while we're actually shooting Tethered? And the long answer is yes. Uh, the, short an oh, sorry. the short answer is yes. The long answer is, is it's not something you want to do for two reasons. Number one, <clears throat> it, it's somewhat process intensive to do that. So you can, it, but these machines are all now, if you're working on a relatively new machine, whatever, they're all, the processors in these are pretty fast and they can pretty much keep up with it. Well, the problem that you run into is the writing and reading from your hard disks. So the processing work is having to read material off your hard drive load it in to the program, process it, and then write it back out to the hard drive. At the same time, your camera is trying to write all its files that it's shooting to the hard drive, and most hard drives cannot keep up with that. Some solid states might be able to, but so what most of the digital techs I know do is this. They will be processing the entire time, but the minute you go to shoot, you can stop the processing. You don't have to, you, you've got all of your files that you're going to process are in what they call a queue. They're in a line to be processed. Um, they pause that queue. I then shoot, 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 shoot. Then the minute I finish shooting and their model's changing, whatever, they would start the queue up again and continue to process. So it's, yes, you can, but what, again, most people would do would be to pause the processing while people were actually shooting. Make sense? File processing. So in Capture One, Capture One, just like uh, Camera Raw, can process files, can create, can take your raw data and turn them into TIFF files. Okay? Um, so let me see here one second, guys. Yeah, this would be a really good time to take a quick 10 minute break. So let's do that. I got sort of, you can be back around 10.30, that part would be great, and then we'll jump back into this. Come to you with a hard drive issue. Oh no! I have an external SSD. Uh huh. It's not. It doesn't use like a standard form factor.